Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our new series, Two Penceworth, where we are going to be interviewing female founders in climate tech and giving them the opportunity to give their two penceworth on the challenges that they have faced. Did you know that in 2022, for every one pound of VC money invested, less than two pence went to companies with female founding teams? And whilst we can't single-handedly change that statistic, we want to do our part to champion the great work that's being done by women in climate. I want to shine a light on the adversity that's still present for female founders today. And most importantly, I want to help share the advice and resources that they have used to help them on the road to success. And whilst we want to be real and we want to confront the challenges that female founders face, I definitely don't want us to be dwelling on the problem. Instead, what I want is to give you some role models because you can't be what you can't see, right? Um, and I want to give you a toolkit, first and foremost, to help make your journey smoother. So here we go, episode one. Um, we've got 10 amazing female founders coming to share their journeys with you over the coming weeks. And first up, coming out of the gate strong for episode one is Claire Rampen, co-founder and CEO of Wreath. Established in 2019, Wreath is a specialist software platform for scaling reusable packaging systems. Their goal is to eliminate single-use packaging, and their clients include Marks and Spencers, Unilever, and Google, amongst many more. Wreath is a fully female-founded business, and along with her co-founder, Emily, they've also ensured they've got really strong female representation at management level across both product and engineering. And on top of this, they built the first open data standard for reusable packaging, closed a pre-seed and seed funding round, they've been nominated for an Earthshot Prize, and in the midst of all of this, Claire took a maternity leave. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about Claire's journey. Claire, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. It's lovely to be here, Sherry. Um, so to kick off, are you happy to give me a little bit more of a background, a little bit more of a kind of narrative of of the wreath story how you and claire met where the idea came from and and kind of the, the journey you guys have been on to this point yeah i'm a big believer in the fact that the business you're meant to found kind of finds you um and it's never going to be a linear journey and it's never probably going to be what you start with um so i'd say in that sense like what we created and are still continuing to create really was like a kind of a meeting of energy between myself and Emily and what we were interested in and our backgrounds. Um, really quickly, to not give you a full CV, we'd met at university about 10 years ago. We'd both gone off and done our own thing. We'd both been very passionate about environmental causes. Emily was planting a lot of trees on the weekends and was actually about to go, um, was looking to go to Cambridge to do a sustainability master's. I had been very focused in um, working in bike share, turned into scooter share, was seeing, I suppose, um, a bit really getting quite frustrated with the limitations of, of um, the linear economy that we were working in, because what I was seeing in that space was we were trying to solve one problem, which was micro mobility and like reducing emissions in cities by transport. But we were causing another problem, which was people were dumping these scooters and these bikes in waterways uh, in you know places of natural beauty. And um, there wasn't really an end of life plan for those those um, vehicles and to be fair the company I was working for was doing a phenomenal job of managing that but there was a lot of companies out there that were just um, essentially spamming the streets with um, with discarded vehicles and uh, and cycle uh, bike, bikes and so um, it yeah it came from a like a place of frustration for both of us um, but also a desire to uh, try and look at systemic solutions and Emily's background was in operations and um, a lot of data management for operations and mine had been in the marketing growth side commercial um, uh, and together we um, set out to solve this challenge of why more companies weren't reusing things and we specifically yeah. started looking at packaging. Very cool very cool and and since you kind of had that idea and you decided to launch the business talk, talk me through where you've come since since then and how the product and the platforms kind of evolved I guess over, over the last Four years now, I think it is, right? Yeah. Um, so they never say, they say it's never a good time to start a business. And I think that's true. I also think the month before the pandemic started was probably the worst <laughs> time. I, we didn't know that at the time, obviously. Um, we decided we'd take a leap of faith. We got an initial grant and we thought, right, let's let's do this for six months. We can always pick up other jobs if it doesn't work out. 
Um, very fortunately, we then won three Innovate UK back grants back to back, which I think never happens. And to be fair, we haven't continued that winning streak. So um, it was a bit of a fluke, but it was um, it's what got us off the ground. It gave us the first seed funding to like really to start building the open data standard. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, as a sort of side note to any people who are uh, aspiration, you know, like as aspiring founders or thinking about starting a business grants are an amazing way to do it with a real purpose and you have to like I described the Innovate UK which is the UK government's grant funding body as like the kind of I mean it's it's the ox bridge of grant applications you have to be so rigorous and that's actually incredibly helpful because you have to really demonstrate the validity of your idea and it helps you understand you know is this something that's needed by quite independent groups um Kind of assessing your idea so for us that was a huge win and a real like um a real boost of confidence that we were on the right path and we'd identified something that did need to be done um we this was that was to build this open data standard basically we'd come to the point that we realized that um there was all these different types of packaging in the market but to have any kind of a, a sort of a functioning system that was going to function at the unit economics that we needed it to, it needed to be really streamlined and data is a huge part of that. Um, and if you can't share data uh, across different organizations in a, a, a way that doesn't breach competitivity laws and things like that, you, um, you're you basically, it's things, interoperable systems are a non-starter. So it became a really clear focus for us that data had to be um, at the core of what we were offering. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. And so you got those kind of three grants back to back that took you through yeah. to kind of what 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 time and you mentioned that you built the data standard with those and then headcount wise, how, how did that part yeah. of the business kind of grow and evolve? So um, we started with those three grants and that was when we brought on um, our product lead, Lauren. And we also started working with an agency that was helping us build the first prototype of the platform. Um, very different kind of agency relationship it's more of a collective of um kind of self-managed engineers which was perfect fit for us and we still work with them today um and we were really focused on designing that data model and in-house and the product management and working with them as a, essentially a flexible resource and i think like for us we wanted to make sure we had the right funding and security to bring on the right um engineering lead and we didn't want to we wanted that kind of like we wanted to make sure we were going for quality when we didn't have the money to really pay for um, quality. And so we were able to forge this amazing partnership, which as I said, is still paying dividends today. Um, and I think that is something that's really worth thinking about if you're at the early stages of a business, because you don't, you know, that's a really critical hire and you don't want to rush it. Um, you want to be in a really good place to make it. So that all that uh, those grants basically took us through to building a first prototype, something that was functioning. That was when we landed our first customer, which was Marks and Spencers. That was a real win because we'd realized that this had to work with corporates. Like um, if you want to actually change the game and at a systemic level, you need to work with the people that sell the most number of products and that was the corporates and so Marks and Spencer is um, connecting with us and having that conversation with them where they realized that they'd hit a lot of the challenges that we were solving for was this like perfect um, kind of moment for us and got us really next stage of that journey which was really figuring out how we scaled our solution for corporates. Amazing, cool. And and through that journey, then where where are you today? I mean, what 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 does Wreath look like today in terms of the platform, where it's at, what the sort of size and structure of the team looks like? What what, what have you built to this point? Yeah, so um, that was when we did our first uh, kind of institutional equity round. Was when we landed Marks and Spencers, and that we that's because we recognised we needed to kind of strengthen the platform. There was various security um, requirements that those kinds of companies have. And so that was when we brought on an engineering lead, our wonderful uh, lead engineer, Kim, and we also started to recruit for some roles in the engineering team um, as well to support her. And uh, I would say that then you have to get quite tactical. So for us, it's been about trying to find product market fit with repeatable sales. And I think in an emerging market, in a climate tech space, that can be really, you need to be like, what we didn't want to do was think that we found product market fit, um, beef up the team and then have to fire everyone six months later because actually we hadn't. And I think having seen that massive hype that we saw build up to COP26 when it was hosted in the UK and then see the massive downturn that happened um, at the beginning of 2022, 
I think we were feeling quite grateful that we've really focused on building a lean but um, tight knit team Mm -hmm. um, and kind of maintained it that way. And some of the best advice I've received from our institutional investors has really been in support of that. They've said like with enterprise sales, it's about making sure you can build the best product you can with the leanest team possible because those sales cycles are long and you're not going to be, you know, you can't just throw resource at it and generate three times more revenue next month. Like you need to be very strategic and these deals can be breakthrough deals for you. Um, But you won't see the dividends of them until later, you know, months down the line. So for us, we've been really playing that game when it comes to uh, team size and, and, um, uh, and thinking and like growth. It's, trying to do as much as we can uh with as tight-knit a team as possible um bearing in mind the market we're in and I, I do think that there's also something to be said for you know you can't just add people and not not think about the impact that has on the team so yeah. we've had instances of where we've added resource and it's actually slowed us down and you know in theory that onboarding phase is meant to then ramp up to an increase in speed but if they're not the right person um then it doesn't and and you then feel the pain of that for months more so i think i'm afraid um i'm saying this on a recruiting podcast but yeah we've just got to the point where we're um we're really really mindful about headcount and making sure we're not just growing for the sake of growing um but that takes you know a lot of it it it's an ego thing to grow your team right so like it's definitely taken a lot of like um discussion within the team about what what kind of team do we want to build yeah absolutely I think I think you're totally right and I think it's that slight ego trip ego trap that lots of founders Mm -hmm. fall into of thinking I will show that I'm running a successful business by growing it making it bigger and bigger and bigger and often that's demonstrated by headcount but you're right there is a real art to being able to do as much as you can with as few people possible and, and getting that balance just right so people aren't overstretched people aren't burnt out but at the yeah. same time, you're maximizing, yeah, what you what you can do with the people you've got. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what are you kind of most proud of? If you could kind of give a couple of, I don't know, I suppose, a um, couple of things along the journey that that you would say that stand out as achievements that 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 you were most proud of. What would you say? Um, I was thinking about this yesterday because I was redoing our website and um, was looking at some of the, yeah, some of the things that we announced to people. Um, and there's been some amazing highlights. So Innovate UK grants were such a <laughs> such an effort to win and such a joy um, in their early days. And um, those kinds of like early traction or kind of proof of concept has been really, really helpful in terms of building our confidence and um, a huge win. And I'll be forever proud of that hat trick, even if it wasn't followed by anything more. Um, Getting into Elemental Accelerator, they're one of our institutional investors, actually, but they also run this phenomenal program. They're one of the kind of old, not old school, um, but just like uh, most established, I'd say, clean tech um, investors and and development programs in the US. Uh, That is forever going to be a a career highlight for me. Um, Amazing, amazing companies that have come out of that program um, and just a really really um trying to trying to build companies differently um you know let's try and focus on to your point like thinking about uh thinking about burnout and making sure that we're not just creating burnout factories in our in our companies um uh and thinking about um you know concepts like urgency which in the climate space there's a lot of urgency but there's also um, you also need to make sure that you're not passing that, creating that sense of urgency. Um, I think in your uh, in your team to the point that it's mis- malfunctioning. Um, yeah. and, and so that's been a real, real eye opener and learning journey for me, definitely. Um, and then other highlights, uh, yeah, getting nominated for an Earthshot prize was a real honor um and the and also winning the clients that we've that we've got having being at the forefront of like some really really exciting reusable packaging initiatives that um we've like been part of getting off the ground uh, so that's been a huge huge um accomplishment and producing a paper that got published um in an academic journal around it's called production sustainable production and consumption uh we did that with an academic partner and that was just like a real 
um, validation that the research that we were doing was at the forefront of, of the space and um, it's continued to be referenced by a lot of academics in the space so it's it's great to know that we've contributed to a much wider body of knowledge. Yeah amazing I think it's so important to take those moments isn't it like you said when you were going through the website recently to sit down and think like what have we achieved because it's so easy isn't it to get lost in the day-to-day -day and forget to stop and think actually where were we two years ago three years ago and look how far we've come so that's an amazing yeah. list of achievements and um yeah in the midst of all of that you had a daughter daughter yeah, Rara, a daughter? yeah. yeah. and I had yeah. a maternity leave so if you're happy to kind of show how because I think there are lots of fans I mean if I think of myself for example yeah. I've, I've always known I wanted to run my own business I set up two years ago but I always had this thing in my mind that was I knew I wanted to have children I thought I'm going to need to get that out of the way before I can do yeah. it um so from from your perspective how did you factor that into the journey um and and how did you kind of manage that as a CEO taking that time out yeah it's funny I kind of felt the opposite because I was like right I need to get I need to do this while I still have all the time and energy to throw at it and I need to get through that first two years um when it is potentially going to be like the hardest which yeah. was True in many ways, although it hasn't got any easier. So that was a false, <laughs> <laughs> um, potentially a false promise. Um, and but I think what it did make me realize was, you know, if you are if you're in a position where you've got a bit of a team, and it doesn't have to be a huge team, but just you know, it's not all on you, then it's actually a really valuable exercise for you to go through as a team because you suddenly realize, like, no one person in that team should be. Um, the crux of everything and yes everyone brings their different strengths and of course like that's not to say that you want to have a team that's entirely swap outable because like you know a team is unique because of the people that are in it and I'm not trying to say that people are, are just pure resources that can get they're interchangeable but like there's a lot to be said for dependencies and making sure that you don't have these huge huge dependencies on any one individual and so I think as a team it's really instilled a discipline in writing things down sharing knowledge in shared spaces um and kind of being able to swap roles when we need to and support each other in different capacities when we need to um and i so i'd like to think that that's that was actually a really helpful exercise for us um all for me it was a huge exercise in letting go of the steering wheel and being comfortable with that which isn't something that comes naturally I think to anybody um and it's not because I mean I was lucky I had a really phenomenal co-founder who was is um like just so good at, at um guiding that ship so it wasn't like I was kind of having to onboard someone for an interim role for three months and you know it, I didn't have all that stress so I was really lucky in that regard but um you know there's also like it's it's still a big it's it's when you're part of a small team you feel you, you do feel your input and so kind of wondering what's going to happen when you step out is definitely something that um it's a big thing to wrestle with but then you have the baby and you're way too busy to think about that anymore so. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah you're totally right i think you're right i think you know that they say don't they that you should build a business that can sustain without you and that doesn't need you at every turn and actually yeah. It, it going on a maternity leave almost forces you to have to do that right so okay. yeah I think that's that's brilliant um and what about that kind of re-entry point afterwards then and and how you kind of then manage to juggle the motherhood with the running of the business how how have I mean I'm sure you haven't probably solved it <laughs> but but how, how do you manage that juggle best you can um I had a great first week back because I actually was still looking after the baby because uh, my childcare had fallen through for that week. Um, and I was juggling her with my foot in her little uh, bouncy thing. And I wrote a grant that was the biggest grant we ended up winning. Um, and I felt very pleased with myself. And then, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can do this. And then uh, <laughs> reality hit and you realize that not every week you're going to be able to just pacify your child with your foot <laughs> on the yeah. bouncer and uh, win a grant. Um, and I know I'm kind of being facetious because I like my view generally is when my child is in my presence that's my 100% focus and I, I I just don't want to put the expectation upon myself that I'm going to be doing seven other things because the reality is particularly with the child I have it's not going to happen um so I guess like the but what I'm trying to say is 
you can have those moments where you're feeling on top of the world and like you're winning at everything and then you have other moments where like you have every kind of bodily fluid all over you and the floor and you're also trying to like get yourself cleaned up for a zoom call in two minutes with some big investor and you're like ah um <laughs> so I've been and I've been in both uh scenarios um I think like the key thing for me was my husband got shared parental leave that was huge it meant I was working from home as well which really helped um it meant that I actually didn't feel like I missed anything even though I wasn't the main caregiver for six of those months um and then we have amazing childcare that's really uh been like a great kind of I feel very good about her being in that environment so um I appreciate that that's a privilege to have that but it's for me as like to be able to continue my career it's been really important um, that is the holy trinity isn't it is is good child care shared parental leave and flexibility yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. Perfect. Perfect. yeah and so in terms of the challenges that you face then along the way because because uh, I'm, I'm sure there have been some how many of those you would necessarily attribute to being a female founder versus just a business challenge any founder would face right it, it, it's yeah. i suppose for you to tell but but what's been your own personal experience then as a as a female in business and and to what extent do you feel you and 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 Emily have faced adversity through that yeah so oh um it's funny because sometimes you probably receive better treatment or you get more opportunities because of that status and then other times and this is the the most frustrating I think is the like very insidious totally not explicit but constant undermining of your status or your knowledge or your expertise or your opportunity set um and, and by that I mean you know you'll get we had uh, an investor that was nearly over the line and pulled out because of um they yeah because they, there was basically some quite veiled comments about um uh, are like the fact that Emily and I weren't a techn technical founders. And even though we had clearly demonstrated that we'd been driving um, all of the kind of the domain level knowledge, and we had been very smart, in my opinion, about how we'd worked with people to get like, to get ourselves to the point that we had a product that was in market with a corporate client, um, that was kind of all being ignored. And um, it was just it just became like, um, a focus on the fact that we weren't technical founders to which I was like well a you knew that from the beginning and b um like so we were meant to just unless we, it, are you saying that unless you're a technical person you're not meant to start a business like it there was a very odd mixed message and it very much um I walked away from that interaction feeling like I don't know how many um I don't know how many men would be questioned quite so much on their level of expertise and I think that's what comes across continuously when feedback from other female founders is like there's not always explicit bias mm -hmm. but then you look at the stats and as you say two pence of every investment is in female founded companies so like clearly there's something going wrong and then you ask you go through the list of questions you get asked and they're minimizing questions you know they're like mm -hmm. they're not about your vision and anytime you have a vision or you manage to do something against the odds you know like start a business a technical business as a non-technical founder then you kind of get questioned on that and undermined on that rather than like wow that's pretty awesome that you did that anyway um so i'd say that's that's one of the kind of continuous frustrations and you know it's just also you say something it's not heard someone else says something who's not a woman and it gets taken on board or um the kind of the old adage of like people just talking to you as if you don't know stuff all the time um uh, so yeah, I, I but it's um, I feel like the best thing I can do is keep showing up and keep uh, doing the things that statistics tell me I'm not you know gonna be likely to achieve um, and hopefully encouraging other people to do the same. Yeah, absolutely. So so it's mainly been that kind of that yeah that minimizing those kind of small like microaggressions I suppose where it's really hard to yeah. put your finger on each one, but kind of a picture of pattern builds over time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what do you think kept you going through that? I mean, how, how did you overcome those? How did you stop those knocking your confidence or holding you back, I guess? Um, oh. <laughs> uh, 
a lot of uh, a lot of running <laughs> a lot of exercise that stress cycle busting you know like get to the end of the stress cycle and do 10 pressure-ups I like I was in the early days quite laughed at by my team because I was often just dropping on the floor and doing 10 press-ups <laughs> to get rid of all the energy that like builds in your body and you know that frustration um and then also like surrounding myself with amazing men like my husband is such he's really good at recognizing it when it's happening to me even yeah. more than I am his radar for that stuff is amazing and he'll be like he'll just tell me that that's ridiculous and com completely support me and make me feel less like it's all in my head so yeah. Um, yeah. those are two suggestions obviously there's so many other ways um, yeah no I really love that um so is there anything that you kind of wish you had known before you set out on this journey that you think could have made some of the challenges that you faced run a little bit smoother or or do you think it was important you found it out as you went along I mean what what is there is there anything you could have wished you had told yourself right if, if you if you could talk to 2019 Claire now <laughs> would that be anything you would you would say I would say that there's no silver bullet and you have to ride the highs and the lows and you have to get as good at regulating your emotions when the great things happen as you do as when the bad things happen and like you'll you'll feel at so many moments in your journey that oh my goodness, this is like, this is either the the be all end all, or this is the thing that's going to kill our company. And it never is. Um, and you have to like start to kind of start zooming out and being like, this is a great thing. There's nothing that makes us bulletproof. And there's nothing that sinks us with one swipe. Um, I mean, I'm sure someone could come up with a million things that possibly, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank collapsing was one thing that almost did sink a lot of startups with one swipe. So it's not to say that that's, you know, a, a completely, um, completely true, but uh, like in the main, yeah. the things that you think are going to sink, you probably aren't in that moment. And, and there's almost always a way back from it. Um, and you have to be brave and you have to like, um, you have to face up to a lot of your internal fears and kind of challenges. Um, I think like the personal work that you have to do as a founder is some of the most rewarding, but some of them most challenging. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and in terms of sort of giving other people a toolkit and some resources, and, and we're going to come on to some kind of quick fire questions in a minute, but there are a couple of things you've mentioned throughout so far that, that I, I kind of wanted to touch on. And the first one being those Innovate UK grants and how you said, you know, grants can be a real lifeblood for an early yeah. stage business. Um, and how difficult actually that innovate uk grant application process is and the amount of rigor that has to go in i mean when when you kind of first broached that grant writing process how, how did you know where to start and were there any resources anything that you used that helped you kind of demystify that and, and go on to win three of them yeah so um it was a person it was uh dr sally beckin from the ktn the knowledge transfer network she's amazing um she's basically her role at the time uh was sourcing grant applications for these grants and pointing them to things like the uh the uk innovate uk good grant net writing guide and things like that um which are all free resources you can find online um and that was she gave us the confidence to just try it even though we'd never done it before and felt we had absolutely no chance of winning it because we just heard how hard it was um and and that gave us a huge amount of confidence you know like having then put a lot of effort into ones that we haven't won in the future, I can see that using grant writing application uh, application agencies can also be really probably good in terms of they know how to play the game. So definitely worth looking at those kinds of um, companies. Uh, I'm mentioning them because I think if you've never looked at the grant space, it's hard to imagine that an entire industry of grant writing agencies exist, <laughs> um, but they do and they can be really helpful. Um, so definitely yeah. worth taking a look there. Amazing. Thank you so much. And you also mentioned Elemental. Um, for, for anybody that kind of doesn't know who or what Elemental is, are you happy to kind of share a little bit more information about, about what, what they are, what that program looks like? Yeah. So Elemental Accelerator is a um, clean tech accelerator. They're actually based in Hawaii. Um, so we have we have investors that span Hawaii to Singapore, which like I just love um, with Scotland in the middle. Um, and they um, yeah, it's a 
it's a program that invites applications from people across four pillars. Um, I, I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, energy, transport, food and agriculture, and circular economy. Uh, we fit into the circular economy space. Um, they are early stage, I'd say sort of like see, I, they, well, they have two programs. They have a strategy and then a um, sort of larger scale program. So you get basically sort of seed to probably about series B um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of companies. And it's basically pairs you with coaches over a period of nine months, um, really specialist coaches in climate tech. It's the most phenomenal program I have ever been a part of. And just the most incredible supportive founder community as well. Um, and those coaches, we're, we're continually getting support from the organization um, for like really specialist kind of coaching in terms of uh, the climate space, which is quite, uh, coaching makes it sound a bit nebulous, but it's actually just like con expert consultancy on certain sort of areas of climate tech as it's emerging, because obviously like this space, nothing is really um, written in stone mm -hmm. all the way through to just like really amazing kind of um, network and pastoral care from other like, initiatives that they run uh, around like team coaching and founders uh, get togethers to talk about challenges they're facing and that kind of thing. Amazing. And is it difficult to get onto the accelerator? Uh, yes. I mean, I believe they have less than a 2% acceptance rate. So it is definitely a challenge, but it's a, um, if you can, it's amazing. And I'm, I still kind of in incredulous that we uh, got so lucky. <laughs> Good. It's not luck, Claire. It's not luck. <laughs> Um, so perfect. And and in terms of quick fire questions, um, so we're going to round off every one of these episodes um, by getting each one of our founders to give us three quick fire recommendations. So these are kind of individual things that you as a listener can take away and look into that will help you on your journey. So the first one, Claire, um, you may have already answered this earlier on, so it's fine if you have, right? Um, but what is the one network, community, organization, a kind of people related resource that you would advise people connect with or join to help them? So my answer for that was Elemental because uh, just connect with them, follow them on LinkedIn. They're very open about their application processes um, and dates. Can't recommend them enough. Amazing companies as well in the portfolio. So it's full of inspiration for people. Um, uh, actually, and I have another one uh, yeah. that's not um, application based, which is Air Miners. If you're interested in carbon dioxide removal uh, technologies, it's like a peer to peer learning network, um, which I learned about through Elemental. So um, really interesting organization. Very cool. Somebody was talking to me about air miners last week, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. so there you go. Funnily enough. Um, yeah. And they do, like you said, peer to peer learning. So there's courses you can take. And there's a is there like a WhatsApp group or Slack channel that you can join channel, as well? Yeah. 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 Very cool. Um, and second of all, what's the one media resource that you would recommend? So a book, a podcast, something like that. So this is more of a that personal growth that I mentioned. Um, I found a really great podcast um, called uh, Enough, and it's all about, I suppose, preventing burnout, recovering from burnout, making sure that you are compassionate with yourself. It's a really, um, in my opinion, beautifully hosted and great discussions um, on there. Perfect. Thank you so much. Because, yeah, the personal side of that founder journey is just as important as the business side, yeah. right? If, yeah. Off kilter. Yeah. There's no other job that you willingly sign up to talk, you know, to like go out and pitch your, you know, baby of an idea to hundreds of people and have them rip you apart as to why it's not good enough to fund. <laughs> it's um, like, I'm saying that kind of jokingly, like obviously it's as much a kind of bi-directional bi relationship that you're trying to find with a funder. Um, and there's going to be loads of people that are not right for you and they're not, you're not right for them either. But um it you know you you have to you have to find places to build your confidence and your sort of strength in yourself um yeah and yeah that it's podcast so, for me is so intertwined with your own personal worth isn't it and yeah. as a founder you almost can't it's really hard to extricate the two so yeah very good yeah. um the third one being um what's the one business role model that you would suggest people follow could be in climate could not be but yeah who who do you look up to um Tessa from Olio, uh, you may be familiar with Olio because they're being a huge success story. Also, a double female founded team. Um, Tessa Clark, I believe, is um, she's a really worth following on LinkedIn uh, and Twitter. She's really, in my opinion, 
rightly so outspoken about the challenges that female founders face, particularly in the funding landscape. She's also very clear on what we need to do to um, tackle some of the climate challenges that we've got ahead of us. And she's built an amazing business. So uh, definitely follow her. Fantastic. And that's an accidental plug, actually, Claire, for one of our later episodes. Oh, where, fantastic. Where Sasha, her co-founder, um, is coming to join us, um, I think, on our ninth episode of the series. Um, so, yeah, watch this space. Amazing. And what Tessa and Sasha are building. Um, but yeah, I would agree with you. I've seen Tessa talk on a few panels and I always come away. She's, she's given me so many little sound bites, so many quotes that are just fantastic. Um, yeah, she is. She is great. Great to follow. So, yeah, if you don't, I, I would definitely second that recommendation. Amazing. Claire, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join us um, and to share your journey and to share those challenges. Uh, but most importantly, to share those resources, because I think for those of us that have made it a little way down the journey to kind of put the hand out to pull others along with us is, is really important. So I really thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. As I said um, at, at the top of the show, we've got um, at least nine more episodes coming up in this series um, of some fantastic female founders. Um, so I'll be updating um, on LinkedIn every new episode coming each week. Um, so please do keep an eye on my profile to see who we've got coming up next. But Claire, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely Thanks to speak so to much. you. Great to speak to you. Bye. Bye.